systems of the pub night last night. Um, it's one of the big reasons I wasn't there. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at Digital Camp London. I want to thank uh, all the organizers and the sponsors of this event. Let's give them all a big round of applause. So this is actually only my third time in the city of London. Um, but I've been to the UK many other times. I actually, while at university, spent uh, a good amount of time living in North Wales. Can anyone tell me what the name of London is in Welsh? Llundai. Llundai, that's exactly right. How about Manchester? Anyone, any Mancunians in here? Yeah, got some people from Manchester. What about Manchester in Welsh? Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> Close, Manchester. Um, so it's really nice to be back in the UK again because um, you know a lot of my uh, studies were here. Um, actually, at university I did my uh, research in Welsh language policy. So um, all of the things that I've been hearing about in terms of Brexit have been very interesting from the Welsh perspective. That's for sure. So today um, I wanted to talk about a little bit of a zoomed out perspective of Drupal. And I'm calling this session Decontextualize Your Content because there's a little bit of too much context in Drupal. And I want to talk a little bit about that in just a little bit. But first, let me just get a sense of the room here. How many people are new to Drupal? Okay, a few of us. How many people are copywriters or content strategists or content marketers in the room? Okay, got a few of us there. Okay. How many people have worked with decoupled Drupal? All right, great, perfect. Well, I hope this session has something for everybody, um, but please don't hesitate to give me feedback afterwards, and uh, I'll be happy, of course, to answer questions. Just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Preston. I have been involved in the Drupal community for about 11 years, and um, I was, until yesterday, uh, the Director of Research and Innovation at Aquila. Um, actually, though, First, I want to talk very briefly about my book. If you haven't looked at Decoupled Drupal before, or if you're getting into Decoupled Drupal, I have a book out with a forward by Dries. It's called Decoupled Drupal in Practice, and I'm very happy to talk about that book with you afterwards if you'd like. Um, there's a lot of really good information in there about decoupled approaches, architectures, and builds. How many people have read the book or looked at the book? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> As you may have heard, uh, I just recently announced on Twitter that I'm moving to uh, a company called Gatsby. For those of you who haven't heard of Gatsby, Gatsby is a static site generator uh, that works really well with Drupal and is built in React. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that in a little bit as well. Uh, I was asked by the Drupal database organizers to put this up. Um, I was actually in Cluj na Poca last year uh, at, uh, on the heels of a Drupal Hack Camp in Bucharest. Wonderful place. Um, I think it's going to be a great event. I'm very excited for it. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our conference that we've got in New York City, uh, Decoupled Days. We took Drupal out of the name this year. We've got a bunch of new tracks, uh, including JavaScript and Jamstack, as well as different headless CMS, CMS approaches besides Drupal. Uh, it'll be held July 17th through 18th. Um, we'd love to see all of you there. It's just a short hop across the pond. Um, and one of the things that we have open right now is our call for papers. So if you'd like to uh, submit a session, Please feel free, we're going to have that open until the end of DrupalCon in Seattle. Also, we have sponsorships still available. Uh, if you're interested in sponsoring the event and want to be noticed by decoupled practitioners, uh, we've got a lot of interest from sponsors, and we actually only have one diamond sponsorship remaining. So please, if you'd like to talk to me about that afterwards, please feel free. Okay, that's it for the ads. <laughs> Had to put in all those plugs. Um, let me talk about very briefly what we're going to cover today. And first, I want to talk about what is one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in Drupal, which is what I call the complexity chain. And this is something that Dries recently posted about in his blog post about how to decouple Drupal in 2019. I also want to talk about the diffusions of innovation theory and how Drupal has played into this theory and how it has not over the last two years. I also want to talk about how people have thought about and conceived about 
uh, actually harmonizing the various experiences that we have, whether they're built in Alexa or augmented reality, all of these different experiences that we work with on a daily basis. And then I want to talk about what I mean by a decontextualized content strategy and what that means for Drupal itself. So first, let's talk about the complexity chain and crossing the chasm. I think this is um, a little bit of a big picture perspective of Drupal, but I think it's very helpful for us to map out how exactly Drupal's history has been impacted by a lot of the trends that we've seen in web development over the last few decades. Uh, Therese Baitar recently posted this blog post about how to decouple Drupal in 2019. There's a flowchart that's very helpful in there that gives you a lot of information about how to decouple Drupal. But later in the blog post, there's a figure that looks like this. And this figure uh, generated quite a bit of discussion at Acquia among our team. Because one of the things that we've noticed quite a bit over the last couple of years, especially over the last 12 months, is what I call motions along the complexity chain. If you consider the fact that on the left side, we have a build or a technology that is very easy to use for people who are not developers. And on the right side, we have technologies that are more difficult to use and require more development experience. One of the things that we've noticed over the last 12 months is that many of the JavaScript, uh, JavaScript developers who are using large-scale frameworks like Angular and Ember is that these frameworks have become extremely complex for more than just simple static sites. They become very complex, and they should really only be used for highly interactive, complex applications. And they shouldn't really be used for static sites. And so while this realm of technology has really moved up in terms of complexity, we also have a corresponding motion down where technologies like Gatsby and static site generators are now beginning to take the lead in adopting more of this middle ground for people of various skill levels. But I want to note here that what we're, not, that what we're talking about here is not actually real complexity, right? Because it's not necessarily true, per se, that these JavaScript frameworks are more difficult. Rather, it's the perceived complexity. It's what we actually think about when we think about building an entire application in React, or we think about building an entire application in Drupal. And we see this right now in Drupal today. Uh, just this morning, I was having conversations with a few of you and learning that many people in this room are already thinking about replacements or substituting different technologies for the Drupal front end. So for us in Drupal, this is what this looks like to us, is that as Drupal theming and Ajax and all of the things that we're used to in building interactive features into our Drupal sites, as those things become more complex for novice developers or those who don't write PHP or don't write Twig, at the same time, a lot of the new approaches that we're seeing in JavaScript are becoming less complex for us. And some very good examples of this are Vue and, of course, Gatsby. Now, one of the biggest issues with this uh, whole trend is that we're losing the ability to hire Drupal talent very easily. Front-end Drupal talent, especially nowadays, is very difficult to come by. It tends to be very expensive. Consider, for example, these current trends that are occurring in decoupled Drupal. If you consider the fact that in JavaScript, we're now seeing a motion towards the more novice developer, where people are saying that maybe we need to make things a little bit easier for people who are just entering into web development. If you consider the fact that there's now the Create React App project, for example, in the React community, or also projects like Vue that have really taken on this idea of incremental adaptability and ease of use. We also know, as mentioned by Dries, that these static site generators like Gatsby are actually simple implementations for a lot of people and actually help to offload a lot of these responsibilities that we formerly had to worry about off to different services such as Neverbond. And we also see, as I just mentioned, that Drupal front-end developers are turning to these technologies because they do tend to be a little bit easier to use. Because Twig can be very complicated, as I think we all know, for those of us who have worked with Twig. And as we said, one of the biggest challenges that people are finding is actually resourcing and staffing their teams. And this is not just a technological issue. This is now a resourcing and a human issue and a business issue that affects each and every one of us. As an example, many organizations are finding it difficult to find affordable front -end Drupal developers experience in Twig. And moving to a JavaScript front end can resolve some of these resourcing challenges. How many folks in here work at agencies that have had trouble hiring Drupal talent? 
a lot of us in the room. So today I want to propose a different approach. And I want to talk about this and couch this first and foremost in content strategy. So once again, we know why people want to use decoupling and decoupled Drupal over Twig. It's because it's the perceived complexity. And it's the fact that we're not really seeing a whole lot of people excited about Twig these days. It is a PHP technology. It is something that's not necessarily something that is very enticing to people who are just entering the development today. And Drupal's complexity, perceived complexity, and this decoupled movement that we're seeing right now in the community is leading to these questions like, well, why, why should we use Drupal at all in the first place? Why should we even bother if we're going to be using these other technologies? But the thing we have to remember is that these same tendencies, these same trends, these same paradigm shifts, these same sea changes that we're seeing right now in decoupled Drupal are actually very similar to the trends that we saw throughout Drupal's history as well. Consider the other big complexity chain that we see in the CMS world. And I know that I'm using movable type here. It's a very old example. I probably should have used some other CMSs. But uh, this is just to illustrate very simply the fact that in the early 2000s, we had this very large trend of dissemination of these blog publishing systems, right? These don't really exist anymore. They don't really exist anymore. They've been replaced by CMSs. And what happened is that people said, well, you know, I want to be able to use something that's more powerful. And I acknowledge that it's going to be more complex. But in order for me to get to that functionality that I know that people want and that people are demanding among my customer base, I have to move up this chain and I have to move up to a more complex technology. And this first wave of CMS adoption that occurred in the early 2000s to mid-2000s, uh, and also the late 2000s, really shows that we actually had a big gap between what people wanted and what we as developers wanted and what was actually out there on the market. So the big question is, if we consider movable type, a legacy CMS, how do we keep Drupal from falling into that same trap? There's a book by a gentleman called Jeffrey Moore. Um, it's a very popular book that you find in business schools. Um, and it's called Crossing the Chasm. Has anyone read the book? Yes, it's a very, it's a very good book. And um, it's, a very, it's, it's actually held up remarkably well over the last 20 years. What this book states is it articulates a theory called the, diffusion of, the Diffusions of Innovation Theory by Everett Rogers. And this theory states that there's a big abyss, not the one underground type gap, but a large gap between early adopters of the technology, people like us, people who are going to look at things like Gatsby, going to look at things like Vue, and those who are the early majority, the pragmatists, the realists, those who are going to adopt the technology because it really makes sense and has penetrated the market to a large extent. And more in this book states that marketers who want to actually pitch this technology and sell this technology should target one market at a time, amassing just enough buy-in to move on to the next phase. But the most problematic chasm, the most problematic abyss, is between those two personas, those early adopters and the early majority. And what's interesting is that Drupal has actually already done this really successfully. If you look, for example, at the history of Acquia, you see this. In Acquia's early history, we were very focused on cloud solutions and developer support and all the things that many of us uh, are doing today for our own clients. And this was kind of the initial phase. We need to have a CMS that's for developers, that works for developers who are building client sites. But we crossed into different personas and different markets that actually worked for a large number of people beyond just those technical developers like us. And those editors who came in and said, well, I need to have workflow, I need to have preview, I need to have all this stuff that we're used to in blog publishing systems and in CMSs. And then finally today, Acquia has really focused on the marketer persona. And many Drupal companies as well have focused on the marketer persona. Because now we want to have more visual control over what's going on and really have a very deep amount of authority over how content is placed on the page and how it appears to the user. But here's the question I want to pose today. Are we now facing a new cast? Are we now losing the developers that made Drupal so successful in the first place? And if so, is it a problem? What do we do about it? Or is it not a problem at all? That's the question I want to toy with a little bit today during this session. Okay. 
So the question I want to ask you all today, and I want you all to think about is, is Drupal in trouble? Does Drupal need to win back developers or win new developers? And does Drupal need to cross that chasm once again? Do we need to evolve once more into the future and leap into the breach? Now let me move to a little bit of a different topic, which focuses more on how agencies and how people in the Drupal landscape today have looked at harmonizing these discrete experiences that we see today that many agencies are building. Because the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves in conjunction with those questions I just posed is, what will Drupal be for in 10 years? Will it be just for websites? Or is it going to be something that is truly for all digital experiences? And what does that actually mean and entail? It all depends on whom you ask. One of the big questions that's happening right now at many large organizations across uh, the world today is whether to centralize data or not. Should we put every single piece of data that we own and every single piece of content that we own into a single bucket that we can distribute out whenever we want to and hand out? There's this concept of right ones published everywhere and a single source of truth. But recently we're seeing different trends emerge as well. If you look at Gatsby, for example, Gatsby adopts a strictly data agnostic approach which means you can bring your own data sources, you can bring your own data, and Gatsby has no uh, need to care about where that data is necessarily coming from. But one of the things that we're also seeing is that many large companies are saying, well, we're doing this because we see an institutional importance within our company to do this, to centralize all of our content, centralize all of our data in one place. So what I mean by this is that harmonizing with ecosystems, these ideas that organizations are needing to have a complete sense of harmony across all of these experiences and understand where they are and what they're doing, is becoming a lot more common as a concern throughout some of the largest companies today. And you've, uh, some of you might have seen some of these figures before, but what I want to do with these illustrations is to demonstrate that we as developers have a great amount of control over what we can do in terms of these experiences that we build. We can build a JavaScript single page application, we can build a mobile app in Swift, we can build any other thing that we can conceive of. But the problem is that once we give this off to our clients, once we give this off to people who are actually going to be editing and working with this solution that we build, we actually have some problems begin to emerge. Editors, for example, can't necessarily preview unpublished content as easily on a mobile app, or on an AR overlay, or on a JavaScript single page app, although there are solutions out there. They're heavily developer oriented. Then when you think about the fact that marketers and those who really want to have visual control over the presentation of their content have absolutely no control over layout and over some of the things that they want to see happen on a mobile app or on a single page app. So if we want to serve all these experiences in a robust way, we have to think about how our choices that we make in Drupal and the choices that we make during the evolution of Drupal actually impact these other channels that we're building today. So I would like to venture a little bit into why Drupal is possibly in trouble today. And I don't want to be pessimistic about Drupal, but I do want to be realistic. And there's a fundamental problem in Drupal today. And for those of you who have followed my talks, this uh, upcoming graph is going to be very familiar to you. One of the things that we're seeing is that what's better for developers is not necessarily what's better for marketers and better for users. We're seeing a change where more custom work by developers is needed to actually make these editors and marketers happy. And we see this today in decoupled Drupal. If you build an application in JavaScript and you serve Drupal data to that application, that leads to a loss of critical functionality. You're losing quick edit, you're losing contextual links, you're losing some of these contextual features that many of the people in our user base have considered very important for a long time. Even if many of us in the community have thought that they're not as important. And so today, if you want to make preview happen, if you want to make in-place editing happen, if you want to make some of these things happen, layout management happen on a single page app, that's impossible without the help of a developer. So the biggest issue is that we have now crossed this chasm and we can't go back in some ways because the editors and marketers are now using Drupal and they expect to have the exact same functionality that they've had for since day one. 
And for us, some of us who are architectural purists, some of us who are really deeply involved in separation of concerns in software, we've always had a problem with the fact that there's this linkage and this coupling between structured data and the presentation of that data. Because this leads, as we all know, to Drupalisms and oftentimes a negative developer experience. I'm sure many of us have onboarded or worked with new developers who are used to other paradigms who have faced a lot of frustration when learning about how Drupal works and how it does things. So the hard truth is that Drupal itself has become far too coupled between three things. Number one, the presentation layer, the theme layer, the twig, theming engine, the website itself, the idea of the website, the idea that Drupal is for the website and only the website. And of course, the underlying web content itself, the content that we all write on a daily basis, the content that we pump into Drupal that is written for a website, but not necessarily written for anything else. And if you think about it, the vast majority of all the content we have right now in Drupal is web-only content. It's not really meant to be used on other devices. It's not really meant to be something that we put elsewhere. And we know also that from our experiences helping people learn Drupal, helping people understand Drupal, especially people who are using JavaScript or people who are asked to do so by their employers, these Drupalisms can be very, very confusing. For example, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot on the Drupal Slack is a lot of questions about uh, cores configuration in decoupled Drupal, which has become a little bit more difficult over the last few minor versions, just because it's a little bit less accessible to the novice developer. You have to go into uh, your uh, services.yaml file and understand YAML and understand how that file works in order for you to be able to enable cores on decoupled Drupal implementation. That's just one example. And we also see, when we look at API responses in JSON API or GraphQL, for those of you who uh, work with decoupled Drupal, that sometimes we see a lot of Drupal information leak through. We see stuff like field underscore blank leak through. We see all of these things leak through that are really unfavorable for those developers building these experiences. Everyone scratches their heads. You know, not only are new developers who are new to Drupal who are really confused about some of these ideas, but also clients, because they're, they're losing some of their functionality. I remember I once spoke to a customer who had um, been asked to work on a uh, decoupled Drupal with React implementation. And this React app was wonderful. It was performance, it was great, it served content from Drupal effectively. But the, content, but the client called back six months later and said, hang on, how do I get to my in-place editing feature? How do I get to quick edit? And the agency, unfortunately, had to tell them, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it's not available anymore. And the client is not very happy. So this is what um, I want to say when I say that we have a big problem, is that Drupal's biggest challenge today, the biggest thing that we face right now in Drupal, is that we have to decontextualize Drupal away from the website and from the Drupal website that is what Drupal traffics in today. We have to get rid of this notion that Drupal is only about the website that it renders. Because it's not. We know this today. We know this from the presentations yesterday about Gatsby and React. We know this about today's community. We know this about today's evolution of Drupal. And we know also, though, that context matters. Uh, I love this image because it really illustrates some of the challenges that we face. If you think about each of these different screens as a different channel, like augmented reality, or mobile apps, or JavaScript, you can see that really one of the biggest challenges we face is the fact that only the person looking at the web context sees Drupal as a, an end-to-end -end system that works really beautifully for that. But we have to think about contextlessness. And uh, how many people have heard of the RCBA message? So the RCBA message is um, a message that is broadcast regularly by SETI. Uh, that's the group of scientists who are working on extraterrestrial intelligence and want to tell uh, extraterrestrials about Earth and tell them about humanity. And what this message actually contains is a lot of information about who we are as the human species without any context at all, without any need to understand the English language, without any need to understand you know, necessarily the way that we use numbers and mathematics. And a lot is communicated here. A lot of this actually 
uh, contains things like the population of Earth, things like the uh, number of uh, uh, days in the year, for example, so on and so forth. And it communicates a lot of information about Earth without necessarily requiring the context of our own understanding of language and mathematics. There's also a concept of contextualization and social linguistics, which is, uh, linguistics is my background, by the way. And contextualization is really interesting because when you think about content and you think about the fact that we really communicate these ideas and the surroundings of our content through this idea of how we communicate and how we actually express ourselves. Consider, for example, how things evolve when you have a new scientific finding that's published in a scholarly journal versus Popular Science Magazine or Quantum versus a Wikipedia article or a college textbook. These different contexts really give a lot of different meaning to the, con to the content itself and change the way that we envision how we want to write content and how we want to manage that content. The fact of the matter is that today all CMSs have fallen into this trap. Every single one, including even the headless ones, have fallen into the trap of focusing on contextualizing themselves on the web. They assume that the context you want to display all of your content in is the web. And that is, today, the fundamental flaw of CMSs across the board. So, when I talk about a decontextualized content strategy, what I really mean is that we as content writers, we as content managers, we as content strategists, really have to move away from the notion of the web as being the only place that our content will appear. Uh, Brett Atwood is uh, one of, uh, he, uh, he was a content strategist at Second Life, uh, worked on Second Life, the game, and uh, worked on marketing communications for Second Life. And he has this to say back in 2013, which is that, you know, it's not just a traditional editor role, it's not just the written word, and it's not just the web. I have to consider how it might be repurposed and redistributed and actually reoriented on other channels of delivery. And in this article, he talks primarily about Facebook. But you can also see in his head that he's thinking about things like the new channels that we're seeing emerge today. So the ideal piece of content that we can write today, and this is a really good exercise in copywriting, maps neatly onto any context at all. Consider this brief paragraph, uh, which is the first paragraph of the Wikipedia article about Islington here in London. If we think about the fact that Okay, this paragraph makes a lot of sense. Where can we see it end up? It could end up in a website with a heading and a read more link. This is something Drupal already does very well, for example. We don't necessarily need to add that read more link to every single content block. But it could also be something that appears in a voice assistant, like Alexa. It could be something that we ask Alexa for in terms of information. Is this paragraph something that is okay to listen to? as a user of Alexa. These are all things that we have to think about. And of course, in the future, one of the things that we'll see more and more is situational interfaces and in-context interfaces like augmented reality. So that when you're walking around as LinkedIn, you actually get information displayed right on that iPad that you are carrying around and you're just waiting to be loved with that iPad. <laughs> so here's an exercise I would encourage all of you to do with your website or your content. Uh, today or tomorrow. Um, consider, take just one piece of content on the website. It could be a block of content that's reused across the site. It could be, uh, you know, a single page of text that you've got on your Drupal site in a node. Consider these questions, you know, if I were to display this piece of content as a card on a mobile app out of context of the website, would it still make sense to the user? If I were to take this piece of content and read it out to a voice assistant, would that make sense to the user? And if I were to situationally display it so that it was in context of an augmented reality interface, would it still make sense? Because it, the website is not enough anymore today. And we can't think about content from the web perspective anymore at all. So decontextualized content strategy involves from the very beginning enforcing a need, a lack of a need for context in your content. It's, it means actually saying, I'm going to make my content so contextless that it makes sense anywhere it goes, regardless of where it ends up. Now, why should we do this? Why is this so important? 
Well, there's a lot of reasons why. The first is that there are, a lot of us have very small editorial teams. A lot of the organizations that we work with, a lot of our clients, don't have large teams. They can't manage 15 different pieces of content based on each channel that that content is going to. Now, what we know, of course, is that sometimes you know, a large paragraph, a lot of text, is not something that's really favorable for certain channels. And that does uh, lead to increased complexity, which is a flaw of this sort of approach. But if we think about content as discrete objects, as Drupal has trained us to do with its unique approach to structured content, one of the things that we can do is to really anticipate any particular channel that might emerge in the future, whether it exists today or not. So here's some things to think about when you're thinking about writing content and writing content for this kind of, content, uh, for, for, for this kind of approach. The first is that, for example, headings might not make as much sense in a voice assistant. Or a sidebar block might not be something that really displays in a mobile app. And how does that change the way that your user experiences your content? Also, calls to action are pretty much meaningless and useless in most other channels unless there's a, motion, there's a capability in that interface to navigate to that link or navigate to that different state of your application or screen. And so overly contextualized content really in the future will become a maintenance burden. And we're already seeing this emerge more and more. And I'll talk about an example shortly that I've worked with in the recent past. So when you think about the fact that we have a focus on the web here, if you consider the fact, for example, that we want to be able to display this content anywhere, we have to think about how this content is going to change for each of these cases. And we know that if we can take this paragraph about Chipotle anywhere, then we can actually display that content really easily anywhere that we go, including on an augmented reality overlay, once again, as we're walking around with our iPad in front of that Chipotle location. So this is a possible approach, and I think this is something that's worked for a lot of people, but it might not work for everybody, because one of the key critiques of this approach is that there's very little variation between the content. And for those of us who have worked with voice assistants, for example, or chatbots, we know that the mode of conversation, the manner in which people like to interact with a chatbot is very informal. And how does that contrast with something like the government website of the United Kingdom, which has to portray a more formal approach? How do they write a chatbot? Is it the same? Is it written in a different tone? Those are questions we have to answer as well. So exceptions will abound, exceptions where we have to think about, okay, well, this content's gonna be in a different scenario. We have to adjust it in a different way. And so this does lead, if you do write content that is particularly oriented to a channel, that does mean that it's channel optimized. But the problem with that is you have a trade-off in maintainability. So that's something that you have to consider as a content strategist, as a developer, as, a, as an architect, is what are the trade-offs between maintainability and between having that harmony across all of your content. Because our notions of content strategy up until now have, have primarily revolved around the web. Most of us have probably read uh, you know, content strategy articles that are focused on the web uh, by folks like, uh, <coughs> folks, <coughs> excuse me, folks like, folks like, um, <coughs> excuse me, folks like Congress, for example, uh, and others who have written on this topic. So we need a different model to conceive of our content. And if we think about content as discrete objects and not as pages and not as blocks and not as visual elements, they can help us to really recast our approach to content. And as I mentioned earlier, Drupal already has this with structured content. But we have to move off of this web-first mindset. So there's one approach that I would recommend for all of you who are looking at content strategy and looking at how your content performs on different devices, and that is performing a content audit. Uh, I used to work um, on the Acquia Labs team, and we built a project for the state of Georgia in the US uh, called Ask Georgia Gov, which was a Alexa skill for citizens of the state of Georgia to ask certain questions. One of the things we did during that project was a content audit, where we looked at every single piece of content that we wanted to adapt to be made conversational and experimented with what are some of the ways that we can fix this content so that it's actually completely contextless and decontextualized. Uh, Astro Gov was a very interesting case study. It was actually a very early uh, adopter of Alexa and Drupal. Um, to this date, I actually believe Astro Gov might be one of the only Alexa skills publicly available right now that engages in a search on a Drupal site as opposed to 
uh, kind of written in interactions that are, that are actually custom. And so some of the things that we did for this project are to rewrite content so that there was less of the calls to action, less of those things that are impossible on a voice assistant. And we wanted to prepare the state of Georgia to be able to actually work with this content in a way that meant they could use it across any channel, including a mobile app, including a chatbot, including an SMS messaging bot, and a voice assistant. And as you can see, some of the things that we did were to reduce those calls to action and reduce the amount of links that will distract the user or make them confused if they're hearing learn more on a voice assistant, for example. This is a really good example of this. If you're on an Alexa device and you ask a question and you get read more about this, that makes absolutely no sense to you as a user of that interface. And that's why we had to add a whole bunch of content here to give the user that ability to say, well, I don't need to go to another link on a website. I can just have the content right there. And this is one of the key problems that we have to resolve in all of our content, because up until this point, all of us uh, have written content or have managed content that's oriented solely for the web. So I talked a lot about what it means for content, this idea of decontextualization, this idea of taking away the need for context from our content. Now what does that mean for Drupal? About four months ago, I gave a talk at Drupal Camp Belgium called uh, the Drupal Frontend in 2024. And this is a little bit of a uh, kind of a culmination of those ideas in a single place. I believe, and this is my opinion, by the way, I believe, I don't know if you agree with this. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I believe that our aspiration should be to create a CMS that isn't just for websites. I believe that our mission should be to create a CMS and foster an atmosphere for us to build a CMS that is truly for all digital experiences and ecosystems in every single sense of the phrase. And what does that exactly mean? It means that we have to move away from this web-based idea of what Drupal can be. Consider where Drupal is right now. And this is an extremely simplified diagram, but what I want to illustrate with this is to show two things. The first is that there's a very big difference between what I call non-rendered channels and what I call rendered channels. If you consider the fact that we have things like JavaScript applications and static sites, which all have some operation of rendering taking place, and then we also have things like voice assistants and chatbots and push notifications, which we have much less control over in terms of presentation. Right now, we can see the Drupal as kind of this single backend. And this backend is coupled with a website, this Drupal frontend, which includes two things. Number one, the theme layer that we all know and love, PHP template or Twig. And second, contextual features. As I just mentioned before, Contextual features include things like in-place editing, they include things like contextual links, layout management, things that require an understanding from the perspective of the CMS of the presentation layer for. But I want to challenge this a little bit because one of the fundamental issues that I think we face today is how people conceive of Drupal when we say the word Drupal. When we say the word Drupal, people immediately think about websites and PHP. I don't necessarily think that that has to be the case. In fact, right now we have something that looks a little bit more like this for many of us. If we are working with a large organization, chances are you have an architecture that looks somewhat like this. And yes, the website, the Drupal front end is still coupled to Drupal and it still has all these features, but we're also serving all of this data to other places like Angular, like Gatsby, to an AR overlay potentially, and all of these things that we're building custom as developers today. In November, I proposed in an argument there that we actually should really redefine Drupal and that Drupal can be more than just a website and Drupal can be more than just a web rendering layer and a web-based uh, content management system. And an aspirational state for us to end up in is something like this, where we can conceive of Drupal as being the sum of all of its parts of the architecture. Drupal is also the front end that Drupal itself is not actually rendering. And I'll talk about why in just a second. But first I wanted to say that one of the things that has come about recently in a lot of conversations I've had with folks in the Drupal community is the notion that we have to move away from this idea of Drupal as a single piece of software. 
Drupal is much more than that. Drupal is an ecosystem. It's a community. It's actually more than just a single system of software. And we can move from this kind of approach and this kind of idealization of our architecture to something like this. And this is something that is an idea I've toyed with for many years. And I've really tried to refine over the course of the times I've given talks about decoupled Drupal. But one of the things that is really interesting today that we're seeing is companies like startups like Simpla or Prismic really trying to control a little bit more of the presentation that happens on those decoupled front ends. Prismic, for example, allows you to actually inject edit buttons into whatever application framework you're using, whether it's React or Angular or Ember, jQuery, they actually allow you to put in edit buttons where every single piece of content controlled by Prismic is located on your single page application. Why can't we do that for Drupal? Why can't we do that for all the things that we actually see in decoupled Drupal? There could be, for example, an in-place editing feature that we create or that Gatsby creates that integrates beautifully with Drupal. There could be a layout management tool that integrates beautifully with Angular. Or a contextual links widget that could operate even in an AR overlay as we are editing content on our iPad walking around the Angel Two station. So if we think about this as Drupal, we completely reinvent how people think about Drupal. If we say that actually what's available on the Drupal front end is in-place editing, but you can have that on Gatsby too, and you can have that on Angular too, and you can have that on Vue too, and they all work in an integrated fashion with Drupal. Because that is what will ultimately lead to people understanding, especially those of us who have clients who want to go into these technologies, who want to go into this realm, but don't have the ability to give up the features that their editors and their marketers use still on a daily basis. So it may seem counterintuitive because I've been talking a lot about reducing context and contextualization rather than reintroducing contextual features. And I do agree. It is something that perhaps is a little bit harebrained and a little bit unrealistic. But the key distinction here is that in a decontextualized Drupal, all of these different channels that we're working with, whether it's Gatsby or Vue or Augmented Reality or mobile apps, they own their contexts. They own their presentation. They own how they display themselves. And that's a totally different idea from what we have been used to in Drupal in the entirety of our history since Drupal's founding. So what does a decontextualized Drupal actually mean? The first thing it means is that channels own their presentation. It means that we leave all issues of rendering and presentation and contextual features up to these channels themselves. And this is an idea that we've already been dealing with over the course of the last few years. But also, crucially, as I mentioned last year in Lisbon, it means APIs for everything. It means that every single operation that we can conceive of in Drupal that we do today in the interface or that we do today programmatically has to be something that we can do through API or a remote procedural call. And finally, we have to refocus on developers. And this brings me back to discussing crossing the chasm again. Because in order to attract these developers today who are not using PHP, who will not discover PHP, who are only turning to Drupal because their employers ask them to, we have to keep their interest as well in Drupal. Many people today have never even heard of Drupal. Many people today who are entering into the tech market and the web dev market have never even heard of PHP solutions or of Symfony. How do we bring them into the fold? So this might be an insurmountable task, and it might be impossible, but I think we do have a shot of getting it right. And there are several things that we can do to get this going. One of which is working very closely with some of these other communities that are out there, like Gatsby, for instance. But we need to do three things. And the first is we have to recalibrate our priorities. We have to keep, we have to keep thinking about what it is that Drupal needs to focus on. We have to integrate more closely with other technologies. We have to work very closely with these other teams to actually be able to work with these new technologies that are emerging. And I believe that we need a new API-first initiative 
Uh, many people are saying that the API First initiative is now complete because of JSON API in Drupal core as of the upcoming minor release. But I actually think there's a lot more work to be done. And I would love to work on this with all of you as well. We have to retrain our customers as well. All of our customers, most of our customers who have begun their digital transformation journeys to borrow business parlance are actually writing web-only content without realizing it in the first place. So we have to educate our clients on channel agnosticism, educate them on this idea of writing decontextualized content. And we have to educate them also on digital ecosystems and help them understand that they're not just dealing with one single facet of their organization. Third, we have to realign Drupal's mission. And what that means is we have to focus once again on the developer experience. I think we've done some amazing work as of late on Layout Builder, and amazing work as of late on some of the modules that have really gained a lot of steam in the editorial and marketer personas. But the problem with that is that we actually are losing those who are coming into the web dev landscape today. And most entrants to Drupal are today actually obligated to learn Drupal because of their jobs, not learning Drupal organically. And that is a big problem that we have to address. And finally, we need to cultivate a new generation of Drupalists. We have to bring those new learners, those people who are taking those coding boot camps by the horns, those people who are actually going into university saying, I want to learn JavaScript and I want to learn React. I don't know what this Drupal PHP business is. And we have to learn from them and attract them to work with Drupal in a new way that has never been done before in our community. So just to end with a few final words here, and I'll take questions afterwards and, and open it up for discussion. Um, we have to traverse a new chasm. There is another chasm in front of us, and it is the chasm that we have left behind a little bit because we wanted to focus on the personas that we've focused on today. We have to win more developers, and we have to win them with the right approach. Secondly, we have to decide once and for all whether or not we're going to make Drupal something that is optimized for more than just websites. Because I guarantee you in 10 years, that will be the case of every single new CMS that comes on the content management market today, uh, in, in 10 years. And we have to decontextualize our content to prepare for this future in a channel agnostic way. We have to move content out of its context and move it into an idea of discrete objects. And then finally, we need to decontextualize Drupal to win over those developers that we've lost and win developers that have never considered Drupal before in the first place. And that means that we have to redefine the, what Drupal means and what Drupal actually does for all of these people. We need a new vision for Drupal that aims to harmonize across these experiences and really aims to focus on these ideas. So let's cross the chasm again. Let's focus on these other islands. Let's focus on these other developers who are integrating with Drupal, who want to have a content management solution that works for them and still enable our other personas. Because as we learn from our history in Drupal, it was developers who started out building the features that the editors and the marketers want. And here, it will happen again. I promise it and I guarantee it. Thank you very much.
uh, we still need to, to uh, fight in the, the rear guard action and make Drupal easy for people, like really easy, as easy as WordPress, because we always give up ground if we don't. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, this, this completely ignores the idea that you should uh, keep, uh, protect your own debate. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a big reason I didn't mention the editorial experience and the market experience in terms of uh, usability and, and just getting people to feel that their uh, features are still intact. Um, and, and that is because of two things. The first is that when we look at how Drupal's history really started out, if we look at, you know, the fact that Really, a lot of these people who started to do Drupal in the first place were people who were engineers who were scratching their own niche for clients, right? If you look at um, examples like CCK and Views, those were, those were projects built for clients by developers. And they weren't very useful back then. And some of them, some of those features are not, still not as useful today as we would like. I believe that we should still focus on those for some of those, absolutely. And I think that for all of the UIs that we have in Drupal, there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen. Nonetheless, um, I think that we have a finite uh, level in terms of ensuring that Drupal stays relevant technically in addition to uh, editorially and in the marketing space. It's a hard problem. I, I don't have the an answer. Um, and I think that you know, one of the things that has come about, for example, is I, I, had, a, um, I had a discussion with uh, Tim Fluckett, who's one of the maintainers of the layout builder. You know, basically kind of playing couple that with it, saying, why are we doing the uploader in the first place if it's only going to be relevant to the website? And I think it's true, and I think it really illustrates the fact that we have two very different beasts that we're trying to serve the Drupal community and the Drupal business landscape in particular, which are number one, those clients who need the layout builder right now and yesterday. And then also those clients who are moving into this. Uh, and also agencies and consultants in the Drupal community who are moving into a landscape where they're having a lot of trouble getting Drupal talent. And we have to figure out how to harness both of these in a way that pushes them forward. I think Dries has done a good job this year of focusing pretty much all of the attention of the Drupal Acceleration team at Aquia on the layout builder and on the API first vision. And so I think by like, pushing these two fronts forward, we can make progress happen on both fronts. Um, I do still think it's one of these I agree with that. And, uh, but I think this can happen in conjunction. Because what I'm arguing here is not that we wash away the back end of the tool. Right? I'm not arguing that we should take away all the interfaces that we currently have in the tool. I'm merely saying that we need to take that web front end that we have in the tool and just make it one of a variety of different things that we provide to our customers. Um, Let's talk about this. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of discussion that we can have. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> <laughs> Right, and have context-specific content. And my argument in response to that was, well, 
what does that do for the small newspaper who only has five editors on staff and can't manage 15 different you know, contexts of content? I think that's a very important point. No one can possibly employ 50 different editors to write content for mobile, to write content for web, to write content for whatever else exists, voice assistant, whatever else. That's just not a possibility. And we see this with the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia told us, they said, we don't have a team that can manage more than one single piece of content at a time. So we need you to keep it unified. And uh, I'd be curious, actually, you know, how many people have had that experience with a client who said, you know, we're not going to be able to do more than just one single piece of content at a time because we have a small team. Okay, a few, a few people here and there. Um, so yeah, you know, I agree. The second point that you raised was uh, the fact that um, there's only going to be one language written that's, you know, only one language you choose to write in uh, So I'd be curious, do you mean in the future or do you mean now? So I mean, now. Oh, I see. You mean, you mean human languages, not programming languages. Okay, I understand. I understand that. Sorry. Okay, yes. That, okay, now I understand what you're saying, not programming languages. Um, yes, absolutely, I agree. But the points I made here have absolutely no bearing on multilingual. If you want to do multilingual, you can totally do that, and that should still be something that the APIs enable you to do. I'm using multilingual as a metaphor for how you use content that is both contextual and non that every single piece of content should be in one language. That's that definitely not what I'm arguing. What I'm not arguing for, yes, but, but channels are different from languages. We can't, have, we can't have any comparison between human languages and context in terms of channels. Like, you can't say that an English language content is like, you know. Okay, yeah, I'll, go ahead. Well, I thought it was a brilliant observation because you're talking about removing the context, and yet you don't explain the cost of that. It, it, it's just incredible. But the, the, the focus, you talk about a small newspaper with five content editors, well, they need to focus on the bits of the channel that are important for them, and then deliver in the same way as if their market was in Chinese, they would be writing in Chinese, if the market is in English. You have one specific case of the um, Georgia state people, and they have uh, I would suggest a, an unusual case where they wanted to deliver over Alexa, for example, as well as the web. But it comes at an incredible cost. Okay, so just to repeat the point, uh, the argument was that um, it, you know, if you decontextualize content and um, you know, uh, don't uh, uh, and allow for a single piece of content to govern, and that content could be multilingual, just to clarify. But that single piece of content to govern across all channels, that comes at a huge cost. And I do agree. That's one, one of the things I stated up there was that there are weaknesses to that approach. Um, but the issue is that as we work with larger and larger organizations that have more and more channels that they have to deliver to, that becomes a huge concern. Who's going to manage all of that content? You can't have thousands of people managing uh, 50 different you know, ideas of content. We do have this already with multilingual. I think that's absolutely something that should stay in place. I don't think there is any sort of issue with having, let's say, English AR overlay versus Spanish AR overlay in the same exact uh, concept of content. And I do agree that there are definitely people who are not as far along this journey who still need to uh, um, you know, have channel-specific content. And that's one of the things I raised there, which is that it does come at a huge cost in terms of complexity. And it's a trade-off between complexity and maintenance, I think, is what it comes down to. Yes, Mike, can we get a mic? Sorry, we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. last one. Off on Mike. Okay. I'm going to talk uh, very slow. <laughs> um, I, I, I think what it comes down to is the argument of who is Drupal 4. Is Drupal 4 the smaller sites where, you know, I 
started as a hobbyist. I started my own Drupal site or is it for the larger organizations, the ambitious sites? And for, for most people, I would, I, I would assume like probably 80% of the websites aren't, aren't going to do single channel publishing. You know, that's what Drupal does, that's what Drupal does really well. And I, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't have a question here, but I, I think the, the trick is just predicting the future. You know, and I think Drupal is predicting that everything is going to go multi-channel, at least for the market that Drupal wants to be. Do um, you agree with that, or do you have any thoughts? Or well, I think what we're seeing right now is, a, is an extreme proliferation in channels that are not necessarily non-web. Right? So if you consider the fact that many of us today in this room are working with Gatsby and are working with Vue and are working with React, those are different channels. If you think about them from the perspective of how Drupal communicates with them, they are fundamentally different channels. And so um, right now we already see that complexity emerging. Uh, and I think for those of us who have you know, simple websites that are just uh, uh, Gatsby, you know, that is still a big consideration for us as well. How do we eventually get to the point where if we build that kind of an implementation for one of our clients, that they don't come back to us in six months and say, well, you just got rid of all my features, now you need to rip, you know, refund me all my money. That's a big concern, I think, as well. Anyways, I know we're out of time. Uh, this is a very spirited discussion. I really appreciate uh, all of the comments. I think uh, that was very, very good. Uh, I'd love to talk with everybody afterwards. I'll be right outside. Thank you.